I'm here in lovely Las Vegas. It's a beautiful day. It's a little bit chilly, but it's really nice because the sun is uh, hitting me and I'm wearing sunglasses because I'm squinting really bad. But the reason for this particular segment is the show I have is Ready, Set, Ghost Sales Hero. And I'm interviewing all the people who I think are heroes. And today who I'm going to be speaking to is somebody who I look up to and has been a big part, not of myself, but of this world. And I call him Coach Steve Miller. Uh, coach Miller was my track coach uh, from 1976 to 1981. He got there in 76 and we both left in 81. Uh, coach Miller would go on to be an athletic director for Kent State University and then actually be picked up by Nike and be the second charge of Nike under Phil Knight's uh, leadership. He also was a part of the, the professional bowlers tour of which he was CEO and so I cannot tell you enough how excited I am uh, to be interviewing Coach Miller. I've interviewed uh, gold medalist uh, Marv Dunphy, uh, Terry Schroeder, um, some people who I res respect but this is about as high it gets for me of people who I know and people who know me. Uh, me being in sales, marketing, PR, I think you're going to see that while he may not admit it, Coach Miller is probably one of the best motivational speakers, but he is somebody out there fighting the fight. Uh, presently, he is the CEO of the uh, Andre Agassi and Stephanie Graff Foundation located here in the building behind me, uh, here in Las Vegas, Nevada, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. So I'm going to talk about life in general, some of the memories, uh, some of the things that he said in the past that have influenced me and what it's changed to. So, needless to say, um, I'm excited about this interview. And I really hope uh, that the viewers here in Ventura County and beyond uh, really are, again, educated, entertained, and encouraged. And this is what this particular show is about. So, sit down, back up, and uh, this will not only go on Channel 6, but it also go on the Ready, Set, Go Sales Heroes website. So with that, here we are. My name is Steve Miller, and I'm the CEO of uh, the Andre Agassi Foundation for Education and uh, Agassi Graph Holdings. It's a, um, a multinational company uh, that deals in properties and sponsorships and a variety of other things. Well, the, the experience at Cal Poly was my, my second coaching experience. My first coaching experience was in high school, uh, and then I sandwiched in a period of time in Africa. I did some work for the State Department uh, in Nigeria, Kenya, and the Ivory Coast, and then mm -hmm. came to Cal Poly and um, spent five years there. I was a head coach of the men's team and actually coached a woman who a lot of people forget was the first female to run under 10 minutes in history uh, for 3,000 meters and won the old AIAW national championship. And during the time we were at Cal Poly, we won five national championships, three in track and field and two in cross country. But the winning uh, was, a, what was a, a subset of what actually occurred. Um, the time spent with the athletes, the, the opportunity to learn from them and also to teach was a, was a great experience. We had an unusual group of people, uh, not that they were strangely unusual, but they were unique unusual. And uh, a variety of athletic talents, uh, young people that were not necessarily the best in the country, uh, and yet we brought them together and the environment, both the geographic environment, the social environment, the coaching environment, and the camaraderie created a, a situation where a lot of people, myself included, thought we were much better than we really were, and then acted it out and became uh, outstanding on the national stage. So it was, a, it was a wonderful experience, but it was an experience that was not only steeped in how high you could jump or how far you or how fast you could run, but more based on who you were and who you wanted to become. And um, together we had quite a journey, and it was a great experience. And then from that, 
you know, you learn organization, you learn leadership, you learn what uh, a team can bring, you learn, you know, both the good and bad sides of, of decision making. And uh, after I left Cal Poly, I went to Kansas State and did the same thing. After Kansas State, uh, becoming director of athletics there at Kansas State and running a, a big time Big Eight program at the time, uh, and then went to Nike to run the largest sports marketing you know business in the world. Uh, retired twice, and uh, now find myself in Las Vegas, kind of in a 360, all the way back to where I started, education and sports. But this is education, sports, and business. And I think each stop prepared me for the next stop, but certain things remained exactly the same. Uh, leadership meant the same things. People wanted to feel good about themselves and each other. That meant the same thing desire to be successful, desire to be recognized by your peers, and a desire to fulfill your own dreams all remain the same. And in every phase of life, whether it's business or personal, those experiences are exactly the same whether you live in Rwanda or you live in Indianapolis. It doesn't make any difference. People feel the same things. Love their children, love their families, want to succeed, want to feel good about themselves, um, and uh, if you can facilitate that, you can have success. And I guess the last thing I would say about all of that is the thing I'm most proud of is, is that I have over 50 former athletes that are now coaches, mm -hmm. which means I either conned them into believing it was a good life or that they really believe that, that coaching had some redeeming values. And several hundred of the people that have worked for me or worked with me are now presidents, vice presidents, directors of companies all over the world. So um, you'd like to think that what you do matters. And um, I've been fortunate in the sense that, that what I've done um, has made a difference. I'm sure not all the time a positive difference, but has made a difference. I think it really, I think it really is more natural than people really think. I think that, that when you think about um, academics and you think about you know, English literature, you don't tie it into a variety of other things. The, the, the ability that I learned or the thing that I learned best from being an English major and from my interest in reading and, and writing really came from my capacity to, uh, to tell stories that would create pictures. So people could hear what I had to say and I could find a way to, to couch those, those statements or those, or the, or those directions in a way that they could see it and they could really identify with it. So I think that the, the thing that, that my education brought me was the capacity and the ability to paint pictures with words. And, and it made communicating much easier. And if I had to choose a skill, uh, over the years when I've hired people, there's been four or five things that I'm really interested in. One is, 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 is can you speak? Can you communicate? Uh, either through the spoken word or the written word. Number two is, do you know anything about, about uh, fiduciary responsibilities and finance? Number three is, do you know a modicum about the law? Number four is, do you have any idea of what social responsibility is? And number five is, do you have an understanding of cultural differences? And if you can get those five th things along with some specific expertise, then you really have somebody who's very special. And in my mind, English literature was the platform I used in order to be able to get myself to a place where I could not only understand and internalize what I was hearing, but take that information and externalize it by either talking about it or writing about it. So I think it was natural, and I think it was really, uh, uh, really uh, very, very simple. We do, we do talk about it a lot, and, and I, think it, I think it is, I think it's, it's more of a literal translation than people think. I think that that value is, is it's, it's interesting. I had a dinner with two people from Taiwan last night, and we actually talked about value, and we talked about it in terms of art, and we talked about it in terms of events and sponsorship. Um, if, if Van Gogh paints a picture, um, and, or, or paints a painting, and I look at it, and I love it, then it's, it has a value to me. Mm -hmm. If I hate it, it has no value. Even though you could sell that same painting, for millions and maybe tens of millions of dollars, 
the reality is to each individual, the perception of what that person sees is what that value is. Mm -hmm. A home that costs you a million dollars to build, uh, you don't automatically sell it for $1.5 million unless someone says there's a value in the neighborhood or in the place that, or, or in this home. So perception is really incredible, really important. So perceived value is literally exactly what it says. Value has a perception. In addition to that, there's also a, a financial value. So if, if you bought a diamond for X number of dollars, and if the market hasn't crashed, then the diamond is worth the same or more. But the reality is, again, it's in the eye of the beholder or in the eye of the person who's doing the transaction. So I, as the salesperson, have a perceived value, and I have a value I attach to it for a variety of reasons. And then the most important person to convince is the buyer, is what does, how can I get that person to perceive the same value? either economically, socially, spiritually, morally, or whatever. So that's, that's really incredibly important. Credibility is important uh, because credibility is the basis for which one builds their, their, their house that they live in. And I'm not talking about a literal home. I'm talking about the way you set up your business, what you bring to the table, connects back to perceived value. If I have credibility, I can enhance value. Because credibility gives you a history, it gives you a long line of opportunity where you've achieved certain goals and objectives, and that credibility allows you the right frequently to say certain things, as long as they're truthful, to say certain things and enhance the value of something. So credibility is key. Plus, when people are looking to be led, or people are looking to join a team, they want the person at the helm or the person they look to on the sidelines or the person who's giving them direction to have credibility. And that credibility comes from history, it comes from successes, it comes from failures, it comes from a variety of places. But credibility is all that you really have ultimately. I am either credible or not. No in between. No in between. Because it happens for a variety of reasons. But the real reason it happens is because we all want to be part of something that is greater than ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's one of the main drivers for religion. It's one of the things, it's one of the reasons people believe in certain things. They believe in it because they want to be greater than themselves. It's the reason a seemingly normal young man goes to a school and puts on a green wig and, and paints their face purple and picks up the number one sign because they all want to be one. You don't see a lot of people picking up the number three sign or, gee, we're number five. I mean, they really want to be number one. So at the end of the day, People want to be something greater than themselves. And sometimes the whole idea of be like Mike, the whole, the whole concept of, of doing something, if you take this, if you drink that, you're going to get better or you're going to get better looking or beautiful women selling cars. There is some association, either overt or very subtle, that says if you do this, you'll be better. But the truth is the only person that you have to make yourself better every day Every single day, make yourself better is yourself. Mm -hmm. And that bar is a bar you understand. And every day you're not trying to get better, then you're failing. And every day you must try to get better. Anything you can do to get better is going to be helpful. And in the end, when it's all over and you're on that deathbed, you don't want to say, I should have and I could have, I would have. You really want to be able to say, I did this. And frankly, frankly, the truth is, the bottom line is, is that when you go and look at your past and you think about the things you said and believe in, mm -hmm. the truth is not much should have changed. If it does change, then maybe you've either had an epiphany or you never believed in what you said to begin <laughs> with. So as a result, uh, if all of a sudden you meet somebody who said one thing 10 years ago and is saying something completely different today, and I'm not talking about political change, I'm not mm -hmm. talking about economic change, I'm talking about basic philosophical changes. If you make too many philosophical changes, then it's probably a sign that you really never believed what you said to begin with. I think the key to it, uh, I, I, I do think a certain amount of it is learned. I don't think there's any question about it. To say that one can just stand up and speak, they're very, very rare and very few and far between. But I think that there's, I, I think that there's a, a reality to speaking, and that is that people have in their system, whether they know it or not, and whatever they want to call it, they have a bullshit meter. 
and the meter goes on, <laughs> on, on and off all the time. Uh -huh. and, and a person knows when they're being conned, when they're being lied to. Not always, but the vast majority of times. So at the end of the day, people know what's real and what's not real. They've seen so much that they, they can differentiate between the two. So they need, they need, it needs to stack up to that meter. Number two is people want to feel good. They really want to feel good. But people also want, they, they want to be told the truth. So they want a, a certain degree of transparency. So when you tell them the truth as hard as it is, the truth is better than lying and trying to, and trying to sidestep the truth. And when you tell the truth and you, and you express your feelings and they know your feelings are true and, emo and deep and, and emotional to you and you give them the news, good or bad, but you finish it with, I care about you, and it does make a difference, then you go back to, was the speech, did it have a perception of value? Did it have credibility to come from a credible person? And did this person speak from their heart? And that meter is always going back and forth. And if the meter registers reality to a person, then it is reality. And, and in the end, um, I gave a speech several years ago, several years ago before HR became a big deal. And I was standing in front of a group of people in, in an audience, and, and I had someone ask me the question about, about motivating people. And I said, you know what, I said, there is no way for me to articulate the way I motivate, but I can show you. So I had somebody in the front row come up to the desk, they came up, I mean, came up to the audience, I came up to the stage, I apologize, and stood next to me, and I turned around, and I hugged the person. And then I let the person go, and I said, that's it. <laughs> I don't know what you expected to see, but that's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. So we hugged, we held each other, um, uh, the, the feeling was was mutual. There was a moment that went just beyond the hug where you're where you're hugging and then all of a sudden you realize that you're really hugging. And then you know what that is and that's how you motivate. So I've motivated by just telling the truth. And the truth to me is the easiest. I'm not smart enough to lie. Well, the, 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 I think it goes back a step further than that. Peter. It Please. goes back to what you're trying to sell. You should never try to sell somebody you don't believe in. True. So as a result, it immediately has perceived value, and immediately it has perceived value to you, and immediately it has credibility because you really believe in it. And if you've had success and you're selling a product that you believe in, then it immediately has credibility, perceived value, and it can be sold. Now, if you're trying to BS somebody into buying something, you shouldn't get any... Oh, you should get nothing but access. <laughs> unless you're in bowling, right? Yeah, unless you're in bowling, which That's the access true. are good. See, the, 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 the reality is is that the is that the game itself and the timeout um, are just moments to reinforce what you've already done. You're not going to come up with a new trick. You're not going to come up with a new strategy. You're not really going to change anything. What you're really going to do is remind them of how they got there. So the key is to, to, to use that precious time to either settle people down, to remind them that we did the work, we put in the time, the money's in the bank, we're in good shape, to remind them that this is the perfect time to go to this play, but it's something they've practiced and done before. So it's never to come up with a new idea. You know, it might be, I remember having a, a, a falter one time um, that I, I said, we, we, he came over and he said, Coach, he said, what is it? Is it my step? What I said, here's my recommendation. Just try to jump a little higher. <laughs> and then he started laughing. I started laughing. And we and I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish, which was to calm him down. And by calming him down, his stride pattern changed, went back to where he was before, and he was able to jump. So at the end of the day, you know, you've been with me at moments where we're getting ready to compete. And there's that moment you're saying, you can do this, you know, you, you can get this done. But... But you only believe that because the money's in the bank. You don't believe it because all of a sudden we're going to create a miracle. Right there. Yeah. Okay, so the reality is you've done the work, all the money's there, so what you're calling on is their memory to get them to the place where they recognize that it's been taken care of already and they don't have to worry about it. They don't have to spend time refiguring it out. It's too late to figure it out. <laughs> if you're giving them a new strategy in the middle of the game, you got a real problem. The humor is, well, it, it, it comes from two places, one place of offense and one place of defense. Uh, defensive in the sense that, that I'm trying to relax myself. So as a result, 
I use whatever techniques I can to make myself relaxed and get under control. And number two is humor is a great, is a great way. It's, it's not only an icebreaker of sorts, but more importantly, it's a relaxing opportunity. It's an opportunity for people to kind of get back to the reality. But it's also really meant to do this. It's meant to let, it's meant to, to allow a person to realize that no matter what it is they're going through, no matter what it is, there is a comparative analysis that really is rather humorous because we're not curing cancer, we're not ending homelessness, we're not doing something that is so serious that we should take it as if, as if lives depend on it. You want to get them to a certain crescendo, but then you want to put it in perspective. And humor frequently puts things in perspective. It keeps, it keeps things orderly. It doesn't allow a person to get too, too excited. You know, when you're coaching an Olympic athlete, I, 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 Kenny Harrison, whose picture's over there, was the Olympic champion in, in Atlanta in the triple jump. I remember having conversations with Kenny telling him, you got to work harder, but don't work so hard that you forget there's other things. Mm -hmm. you got to think about this all the time, but don't think about it all the time that you forget there's other things going on. you gotta, you got to train all the time. Don't train all the time and forget that there's time to do other things. It, you have to, it's, 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 a, it's a terrible, terrible... Um, uh, 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 contradiction of sorts, but the contradiction is what makes what makes it interesting. And putting it in perspective is really the issue. And humor is one of the ways to keep perspective. It just sometimes pops in your head. It seems like you no, not. I I think that I think you'd be surprised <laughs> that 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 uh, before I speak and before I go on it or before I spend time with athletes, it may seem extemporaneous, but I go back to the same thing, um, and that is. The money's in the bank. You've put in the time. You've put in the effort. I know this person I'm talking to. It's not an unknown audience. And as a result, I know what the levers are. It's not as if I haven't practiced it before. <laughs> it's not as if I don't understand it. Yeah. So I know just how far I can push and, how, and, and, and when I need to pull back. So it may seem extemporaneous, but the truth is um, it comes from years of experience and practice. It, it, the, the humor comes from a... Yeah, it comes from a place of pride. It comes from a place of joy. It comes from the fact that you, that 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 audience, you know, that audience was a track audience, so it was easy to talk about five repeat four hundreds. <laughs> if it was a football audience, I would have talked about you know throwing his, throwing the ball to him until his hands bled. I mean, I it could have been any number of things. So so what you do is you take the you take the platform that you have and you use that platform to express uh, a, a feeling and an emotion, mm -hmm. and and and, and mm -hmm. sometimes. That emotion does, I have to admit, does come up funny, and sometimes it comes up serious. But I always mix the two because I think, I think, allowing either one to go too far is is debilitating. Yeah. I would I would tell them the same things that I've I've told young people, you know, all my life. And when I say young people, I don't mean I don't mean that literally in terms of, you know, kids ten to twelve or fourteen to eighteen. I'm just talking about people that I've dealt with, people that I've coached over the years. I've, I I tell them kind of the same things. Your future is in your hands. You determine your future. I don't determine it. I, I can give you some guideposts. I can give you some signs. I can give you some help. But the truth is you, you, you're the one who determines it. You decide how much you're going to work and how much you're not going to work. You decide what peace and joy is. You decide what you will stand for and what you won't stand for. So I tell them the future is in their hands. It's not in somebody else's hand. And, and other than an apocalyptic outcome, you have the, you have the opportunity to change the world. Number two is I tell them that, that you, you have to elevate your own perspective of yourself. You have to give yourself a chance to be the best you can be. I'm sure that when Rosa Parks was a 12-year-old or a 9-year-old in Montgomery, Alabama, laying in bed, she wasn't going to say, she wasn't saying to herself, one day I'm going to get on a bus and I'm going to decide I'm not moving and, and I'm going to change, you know, the movement in America. But it happened. It happened because Rosa Parks' life led to that point. But it didn't happen in just that moment. It happened in all the moments leading up to that moment. So you, you have to believe you can do certain things. You have, the, you have the future in your hands. You have to believe you can do something about it. And then you have to believe in each other. You have to believe that other people are capable of seeing things the same way. And even if you disagree, it doesn't mean you can't find some, some medium ground. Do I think everything can be discussed? No, some things just can't be discussed. And finally, I would say that, 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 the, that the real key to it is 
taking care of your own backyard. Mm. If everybody took care of their own backyard, if you took care of your house, if you took care of your home, your family, your vision of what's right, if you would do that, conflict would be much reduced. If we all realized we all shared the same earth, the same feelings, we all had mothers, we all had fathers, we all had sisters, we all had brothers, most of us had sisters and brothers. We're, we're all virtually the same. We're just cut a little different. Some are a little taller, some are a little shorter. We're, we, all, we all are sharing the same experience. So to me, it's the same thing. You have control of your future. You're better than you think you are. Get along with people and take care of your own space and, and world. And you have a shot. If you decide you don't want to have a shot, then it won't make any difference because everybody will be screwed. Everybody will get hurt. And if that's the end, then you had control, as I said. You decided to press the button. You decided to drop the bomb. You decided to shoot the bullet. That's your decision. That's your decision. But in reality, we have control. Governments don't have control. The police don't have control. The military doesn't have control. You